Okay, today um, is the transition day from vine to ivy. And for the next 18 days or so, it's the days of ivy. I'm going to show some pictures in a little while, now that I'm getting the hang of Zoom a little bit. Um, but before I do that, I'll go over the Bryatheroam word kennings for Gort. Uh, it's one of the 20 that isn't necessarily what you think it is. You know, uh, beef is birch and, and um, dua is oak and stuff, but they're not all definitely trees. So uh, Gort, uh, strictly speaking, translates as field as in the field of grass, you know, theoretically. Um, so the word kennings relate to that more than ivy. Um, so the, the first of the kennings says sweetest grass, grass, you know, so it's just a field of grass. Um, the second one says a suitable place for cows. <laughs> so just... Uh, cows grazing in the field. Um, the third one is a bit more interesting because a field needn't always be grass. It can be a field of wheat or barley or grain as well. And the third one seems to refer to agricultural field. So it says sating, as in satisfying, uh, sating of multitudes. So it sounds more like a field of wheat or a field of barley, you know, that is this field's going to satisfy many, many people. I guess a field of cows could be that too, with milk and dairy and meat, you know. Um, so yeah, the, 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 um, the idea that it might be a field of grain, I think is interesting because ivy leads us up to broom and broom is the maiden aspect of the serial goddess. So that's quite interesting, you know, she, she's part Virgo, part Leo. Um, so that ivy takes us to the first expression of this, the harvest goddess or serial goddess is interesting. So just going over those then, the kennings, sweetest grass, a suitable place for cows, or the, the sating of multitudes. But the scholar's primer, which is the same source, uh, both from the book of Ballymote, which is 1390 AD, says, greener than pastures is gort, i.e. ivy. So the scholar's primer uh, is the one that gives us the tree list and it says it's ivy. Uh, greener than pastures, but it does make a reference to pasture or field, you know. So, um, so that's the word kennings uh, for what they're worth. Um, ivy is a really unique uh, plant uh, and its patterns in the Owen Grove are quite interesting, so I'll use pictures to show that. But one of the exceptional things about ivy, and a lot of people overlook it as little more than a weed, you know, or a pest because it's climbing up trees and depending on your persuasion, spoiling the look of the tree. I, I quite like, like ivy in trees. Um, it's perfect nesting for birds, you know, so it serves a purpose. But more, more special than that is it's, it's berries, its fruit, um, are the flowers that lead to the fruit are the last flowers of the year. They're the final source of nectar for bees and, and butterflies and other insects and stuff. So, you know, so just when everything is running out, ivy gives a bit more to all the little insects and, and bees and stuff. Um, it's quite interesting and it does that flowering and fruiting between September and November. It goes from September through November. So that's actually Samhain. You know, uh, the ivy flower is the final flower and it, it 
it's that transition of Samhain and that, that Samhain thing, very important when we're looking at the mystery traditions, because with the mystery traditions around this time of year, around Lunasa or harvest time with the cereal goddess, who was Virgo, um, that's when initiates would go into an initiation, right, and descend into the mysteries to be reborn in the spring uh, from the Bardic tradition at Beltane. Now, this quarter of the Oem Grove, we've touched on it already, sings of those mystery rites, and it begins with vine, which is the wine, and now it's ivy, and vine and ivy were mixed together in ancient Greek mystery traditions for Dionysus and Bacchus and so on. And so wine is intoxicating and it loosens the inhibitions and ivy alters the mind, it alters the state of consciousness. And you can do that without um, making a brew with wine. You can just chew ivy leaves and that's slightly mind altering. And don't eat them. So it's a bit like tobacco, you chew and spit, chew and spit, you know, and the chemical goes through your gums into your brain. You really don't want ivy in your throat or in your intestines, not, not good. And it burns the throat, I've, I've tried it, but um, yeah, it's a slightly mind altering thing. When I say I've tried it, I've chewed about four or five leaves, you know, and um, I'm a bit of a lightweight. I've never done any hard drugs or, or even boozed alcohol that much, but it made me floaty. It made me it, what, what, quite interesting from a Tai Chi experience background. I was very aware of the tension in my neck and shoulders going away. That was quite interesting. I could feel my spinal cord being loose. And, uh, and then I became quite preoccupied with the color orange of rust on the field gate. I was just staring at the orange rust for ages, you know, but I didn't have any major visions or anything, but then it wasn't mixed with wine or, or what have you, you know. Um, so, but here's the thing then, uh, vine, starts the sequence. Ivy is there as a companion plant for the special brew. And then Broom, the maiden goddess, is the constellation of Crater, the wine mixing cup. So Vine, Ivy and Broom, because of Crater, the wine mixing cup, are all preparatory for sacred marriage, alchemical union, uh, rites of lunacy, uh, descent into the mysteries, all that kind of thing. And we've touched on that uh, in the recent video for the Middle Cauldron. So if you haven't seen the Middle Cauldron video, you can look that up. So what we've got here with Ivy, um, yeah, is this, pattern of mystery tradition stuff. Now I'm going to use pictures now to demonstrate that further. So just give me a moment. Okay, so this first diagram <clears throat> shows the four Celtic fire festivals <clears throat> and how they fit into the Oem. The Oem is 20 trees spaced around a year evenly. Each tree's got 18 degrees. And this is how they work. If you look at the bottom right, Oak and Holly King, Oak King, Holly King fight each other at Beltane, you know, and top right, you've got Rowan and Alder and Rowan has law to do with the goddess Bridey Bridget, and that's in bulk, which is the festival of Bridget. There's just an example of natural patterns in the Oem Grove, and this isn't any contrivance by me. This is the tree list from 1390 AD, you know. So if you look at the bottom left, uh, the festival of Lunasa. So we're into ivy, and it joins broom. So Lunasa is actually between ivy and broom 
and all of the lore about Broom is she's the summer queen, she's the summer bride, and so on, you know. And Lunasa is, of course, named after Lu, the, the lord, the god, the, the, you know, the bright young lord. And so this seems to be a natural marriage between what you could call the summer queen, maybe the summer king or the, the, the lord of the other world. Um, traditionally in ancient Greece, Dionysus and Bacchus uh, were crowned with ivy. So we don't know who the Celtic Dionysus or Bacchus would be, but Lou fits this. And also this time of year, you know, if you've got a sacred marriage and then you have honeymoon night, and the child is conceived, then nine months later, they're born at Beltane. It's a natural pattern of the year. And in bulk translates as in the belly or in the womb. Sometimes it's, some people see it as a lactation of ewes, like milk, first milk. Um, but whether it's first milk or in the belly, it's, it's a, a babe not yet born. But you know, conceived at Lunasa, born at Beltane, and that's the pattern played out with Keridwen and Taliesin. She consumes Guion back as a grain of wheat. Remember, cereal goddess consumes him as a grain of wheat, and then he gives birth to him at Beltane. So, so that's where we are with Ivy. Uh, Ivy will take us up to the exact moment of Lunasa. Now, Ivy is one of the evergreen pentagram trees. Now, the, uh, the next picture I show you will kind of illustrate things how I first saw it. But <clears throat> initially I was doing an illustration of a grove of the oam, and in the far distance, furthest away was the yew tree. And in the foreground to the left and right, was holly and ivy. And I was just staring at them before it clicked. And, and when, after I'd been staring at it for a while, I realized that the space between holly and ivy made a pentagram. And then I carried on and found pine as well. So there are only four evergreen trees in the whole tree list, but they hold the positions of a pentagram. Willow is the odd one out, but willow, in a way is evergreen in the sense that you can take a twig, snap it, stick it in the ground and it will become another willow tree. So it kind of has the potential of ever living, if you like, you know, that's me grasping at straws a little bit, but the only four evergreens are there in the positions of the pentagram. And those that are familiar with it, there's also a yin and yang to this where the rose family trees make a pentagram too and they interlace. Now, this pattern of the pentagram is fascinating. Um, it suggests there's a whole law hidden in the Owen Grove to do with Venus. Uh, Venus uh, symbol is five, you know, Venus does a five petaled orbit every eight years and traditional herbalism, anything with five petals is safe to eat and it's governed by Venus and so on. So some things are obvious, like hawthorn blossom has five petals and, and so on. And the, but there's also more hidden pentagrams, like you can cut an apple in half and you get a pentagram. And I haven't got a picture with me at the moment, but if you cut uh, a yew stem through, it's a five pointed Thing as well. Now, when we come to ivy, there's a hidden pentagram with ivy as well. And I'll show you, it's quite wonderful. Here's an interesting thing. So this is what I originally saw when I was illustrating things, um, that there is this balance of holly, ivy, and you. And if you were gonna draw a pentagram, um, starting at the top, you would put your finger at you and come down towards the right hand side towards holly, you know, because willow isn't an evergreen, holly is the first evergreen in the Owen groves. So if you're doing a pentagram, you would start at 12 o'clock at you, come down to holly, and then you'd go off to pine, to willow, 
then to Ivy, and Ivy then would take you back to you. So Ivy, in a way, is going to lead you to the winter solstice. A quite interesting pattern there. And I was reading about um, the winter solstice, ancient celebrations of Rome, which were called the Saturnalia and named after the god Saturn. And here's a wonderful thing. I didn't know this until recently. Um, Saturn is traditionally depicted with a holly uh, club or, or a holly branch or whatever, and a nest made of ivy in which was a wren. You know, so there's this, there is this special relationship between winter solstice, yew tree, holly and ivy with Saturn, Saturnalia, having the holly club and the ivy nest with a wren inside. Now, this is actually a, a hidden head in Cornwall, a very special place that I keep to myself. Um, I don't know how old it is. It's been a, a long time. I've, I've known it for about 30 years, this head. It's just in an old stone wall. But it's to make me remember to talk about Ivy's position in the sun's ecliptic. Now, we touched on this, I think, with the Middle Cauldron clip as well. So Ivy takes us from the last, uh, from, from, from the Cancer the Crab into Leo the Lion. And that cusp between Cancer the Crab and Leo the Lion is the top of the head in a planetary chakra system. So like one part of the mind is lunar, one part of the mind is solar. And from that position at the crown of the head, a line comes down through the body, like the Indian chakra system, but going through the body, it's different planetary uh, chakras or wheels, you know. So you, you have sun and moon above the head, and then you have Mercury, and then you have Venus, and you work your way down to the very bottom, which is the Saturn which is Capricorn and Aquarius and Saturnalia and sort of thing. So the winter solstice is down between your legs energetically and the summer solstice uh, is your stimulated pineal gland at the top of the spine and the left and right or sun and moon aspects of your brain, if you like. But um, there's other patterns within that. So... Um, with the three cauldrons, each cauldron has a star law pattern. So the star law pattern of the upper cauldron is called the sun cross. And the sun cross is the winter solstice, summer solstice, spring equinox, autumn equinox. Now, Cancer the crab belongs to the sun cross. So Cancer the crab is part of the upper cauldron. You know? Now, Leo the lion, Leo the lion is part of the middle cauldron. So Leo the lion is part of a pattern called the Royal Star Cross, which is Aquarius, Leo, Scorpio and Taurus, you know. So energetically, as well as Ivy being moon and sun, it also takes one from the upper cauldron to the middle cauldron, from Cancer the Crab to Leo is going from the upper cauldron to the middle cauldron. Leo governs the heart. So quite interesting then. So there's this, you know, uh, in breathing meditation, as, as well as a philosophical idea, you know, you breathe in and you draw energy up from winter solstice between your legs and you breathe in and the energy comes up your spinal cord stimulates your pineal gland that summer solstice and your sun and moon are invigorated or titillated or whatever but then that ivy gives you that moment but then straight afterwards the energy is kind of going oh so it's actually bringing energy from the pineal from the crown and the upper cauldron IV starts the descent of the energy towards the middle cauldron into Leo governing the heart. And 
at Leo governing the heart is going to be Broom, the grail maiden aspect of the triple goddess of Virgo serial and stuff, you know, which is perfect for descent into the mysteries and coming together within yourself with your own yin and yang or sovereignty, alchemical marriage of your inner and outer and your mortal and immortal and so on. Enough of that. Look at this. <clears throat> um, this is the berries of ivy. And they don't really come out, like say, until September, they start to appear. And then as you get into November, they start off pale green and they get bigger and bigger and darker and blacker and blacker. Uh, this is English ivy. It's not the same thing as the American poison ivy. That's a different plant. They're related, but this is different. This is the traditional English ivy. Now I'm going to show you a close up of one of the berries. The fascinating things. They're about the size of a golf ball is how big they are. And they're a cluster of berries. Now, if you look at the one in the middle, you see there's a kind of white ring with a dot in the center. But around the white ring are five stations. You know, it's like the sun's ecliptic with five positions on the ecliptic. Here's a close up. It's a bit blurry, but here's a close up of one berry of a golf ball of berries. You can see the pentagram there. You know, there's a darker purple area at the top. And then from there, you can work out the five. You can see the hidden pentagram. You know? So like I was saying, there are hidden pentagrams as well as obvious pentagrams like cutting an apple in half. You know, the ivy is there, part of the evergreen pentagram. And it carries the pentagram in its berries. Right. <clears throat> Before I finish, then I wanted to share a nice book. I've had this book for ages. It's a bit battered now. The pages are beginning to fall out because the glue's dried up. It's a lovely thick book. Um, it's a Capel Band book, Herb Craft by Susan Lavender and Anna Franklin. Okay. Here's a thing, and they're coming from a kind of folk magic, uh, traditional witchcraft, herbalism kind of background. They're not really coming from an Owen Grove background. So what I'm about to read, it's really interesting, it's insightful, and they're relating ivy to initiatory rites at this time of year you know, unaware of its position in the Owen Grove. They're thinking of Ivy and Dionysus and Bacchus and so forth. But I'll read this little tiny paragraph and it just sums up what I've been saying about initiatory things. <clears throat> so it actually says, Ivy is also the change of consciousness that takes place at initiation bringing with it the gifts of prophecy and vision. It teaches the lesson of sacrifice. The old self must be left behind or die before a spiritual rebirth can take place. So that's Herbcraft and Ivy. Right. Um, I'll stop recording here and we'll have a chat about everything before we do a meditation. So I'll just turn the video thing off. You can put your microphones back on. What was the